this would be a sole source. Uh, the difference was that it shouldn't have been a sole source. He was dealing with preferred vendor. Uh, upon the audit, uh, they would determine there was a difference in that characterization. Uh, so we had basically bought from a preferred vendor as opposed to a sole source. So that's why we ended up having to pay the money back. Okay, and, and based on the information that procurement received, did they do anything? The uh, they they had no reason to to dis they had no reason to question the procurement documents received from the department because that should have been the, the expert in that particular field. Yes. And, and to prevent this from happening again, is there any policies or procedures that we can put in place? Yes. What what we're asking now is that instead of a sole source in those particular areas, we would we would person would double check that and make sure that it, it is accurate at this particular point in time. What did person's president Commissioner Williams? Mr. Mayor, first of all, I hadn't heard in my answer, I hadn't heard from procurement or whoever wrote the letter, I need to hear. I mean this letter entitled itself. I know we got emails that go out, they go through the air and all that, but I don't think it they put it on itself on paper. I need to know where did the letter come from? First of all, that's my first question. I'm, I'm not finished, but I need to answer that from whoever in charge. Do we have anybody that can speak to that issue? Is that was Mr. Russell? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the department here, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. We got several department heads normally here that I don't know to see anybody here now, and I want to know why they're not here. <laughs> Last week, we had the assistant director come here with issue that we couldn't get an answer to because the director was out. They ain't out of money, but he'd be out of place. Do we have anybody to speak to this issue? Stop. Stop. Okay. Ms. Sam. Mr. Mayor, Mr. My question is, Ms. Sam, is that letter that was signed by the former mayor for Tim, Joe Bow? We sent to the federal agency telling us that we were in compliance, which we wasn't in compliance, we're not paying money back. That comes from you, your, your person, your office, your people. That's yeah. right, did not. Okay, well, can you tell me who I need to direct the question to? Uh, you were able to direct that question to Ms. Williams. Okay, Ms. Williams, can you answer that question? Who, who wrote this letter? Ms. Williams, you have to answer that and I informed y'all last, last meeting when the item was approved that this was an ongoing discussion between us and the SCA after the grant findings came out in the 2010 audit. This, we were attempting staff and our external auditors and the SCA were attempting to resolve this by avoiding a repayment. We were originally told that we would be able to make a qualifying purchase to substitute for the money that were spent on this purchase. There were numerous conversations with both FCA, our external auditor, Sherry Becker Collins. This letter is based on language from the results of a meeting, a phone telephone conversation with the FCA, my recollection recollection, I believe it was the gentleman that's on the email that I provided you a copy of after you requested it at the last meeting, a Chris White, members from Cherry Becker and Holland, they essentially told us the language that they would accept to come from us saying what we had done. We were not getting the answer to the questions. I would motion that we send it back to committee. And, and I guess give them opportunity to come back with 
proper documentation to find out exactly how we got in this quite a or whatever information that uh, needs to be a contributor uh, to the commission up here so we can get a clear understanding of what happened. I mean, I understand what took place and why we got in this jam, but I guess at some point we need to make sure we have a safety net there to make sure it doesn't happen again. Is there a second to that motion? Okay. Mr. Russell? Yeah, you know, I'm not too sure how long you want to read this horse. And that's pretty much where we're at at this point. I can't begin to tell you how many times that we just said what, what you're going to end up hearing. We made a mistake. That mistake was caught in the audit. The audit said that we, after a period of negotiation, would, we would not have to pay that money back. We weren't based on that philosophy until we were informed by the feds that they changed their mind. Why they did, they took time out of this day to come down and, 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 and speak on it. I'd like to hear the pros and the cons on uh, putting this back in place. And so this, this time out, I think it's just, just fair for us to listen to them and give them a, a chance to voice without just denying it like that. I completely agree with you, and I was going to do that before calling for a vote. If we have representatives, one from either side, one from pro, one from designated representatives against, I'll give each side five minutes if there's a representative that would like to speak. Okay. Okay. Mr. Wall okay. First of me, uh, I'm a native Sanford boy. Uh, Glenn State address and please. Uh, my home address is seven eleven Woodgate Court and I got the uh, first I'd like to thank you very much for allowing us to uh, speak on behalf of the program. Uh, the things that I like to do are, are quite simple. Um, what I'd like to do is actually um, first lay out the law that allows us to do PA business improvement district and then say some of the facts about how it gets done. And the reason I like to do this is because what I've noticed in most of the discussion uh, about the business improvement district, very seldom um, is the law actually discussed. Very seldom is there any um, comparing information to the law and the facts. Uh, and I think really that the law um, and the facts are the things that should got all the discussion about it because without that, none of this would actually be possible. Um, that said, I'd like to read what the requirements for creating a VAR. are. Uh, first, you have to have a written petition signed by either 51% of the municipal taxpayers of the district or about 51% of the municipal taxpayers only at least 51% of the taxable value of the property in the district. And the, and the reason for that is to give all the people in the district the opportunity to create a business improvement district. Lord, I heard you say about 51% of the district, not the downtown, but the district, 51%. Are you counting that 51% as being the, the, the people in the district, or you are uh, that 51% you're talking about downtown? Because I don't think we can set aside downtown in the district from the rest of the people in the district, because we're going to clean up. And I, I'm, I'm hitting both sides. I want to hit that side too. We're going to clean it. Uh, we, we need to make sure that downtown is clean, not just Broad Street or uh, the business sector of Broad Street, but when you leave Broad Street, you ought to have to go through the jungle, like I do when I go home in the, in the hood. You ought to basically go straight to <laughs> a clean area. So I'm, I'm saying that, are you considering that 51 percent downtown, are you talking about the entire district? Mm -hmm. Because these are words you use, not just the ones. The 51% actually is the properties in the boundaries of the business improvement district. And in this case, it's from 13th Street back to a little past 8th Street and from Reynolds to Green Street. That's the, the district that I'm talking about. 51% of the properties in that boundary, in those boundaries. 
out there publicly that they will make changes to the board before next December. The competition of the board should have been changed before they came back before you two days, not nine months from now. Katie Board said that they have cut ties with the Downtown Development Authority. Yes, they have two members of the Caddy Board, Madam McLeod and Mr. Lloyd, who are on the DDA and the Caddy Board. A current member of the Caddy Board, Mr. Paul King, is a past member of the DDA, so it's all still intertwined. Uh, Caddy is basically a cleaning service, so let's see how they're doing. This is the 2012 Caddy Report. So they load the little segways and the bikes, 3,283 yearly hours of basically nine hours a day to accomplish the following. 59 yearly town hour reports for about one a week. 5,605 yearly merchant visits are 15 a day or two an hour. They gave assistance to the stranded or lost people 767 times or two a day. They removed 1,939 handbills from public property or five a day. This is the one that gets me. They handled 11 police assistance calls a year, less than one a month, so much for security. They handled six domestic care calls, or one every two months. And they removed one ton of garbage per week from the uh, dead area. All this for $350,000. All right, now where's the trash? We have been without the services of the caddy for the past 13 weeks. Using the caddy statistics I just showed you, where they removed a ton of trash a week, there should be 13 tons of trash all over downtown. This amount of trash should be very conspicuous. In order to find these mounds of debris, this past Sunday morning, my wife Robin and I walked every sidewalk, not only in the big area, but the entire central business district. From Green Street to Reynolds Street, from 5th Street to 13th Street, and we picked up trash. Yeah. This is an example of the trash that we picked up. And this is how much the trash weighed. That was about it, 28 pounds. And this is the one bag of trash we got, one bag. Voluntarily, I walked, I picked up the gutters, the sidewalks, the medians, everywhere. That's all I could find, which tells me our city is doing a great job. Caddy is not needed. All right, here's the district graph map, Mr. Williams. If you notice, it doesn't even cover all of downtown. It only covers a little gerrymandered district. And there are, as I said earlier, 373 parcels of property. 100 petitions were presented, but they were only signed by 80 people. Eight of those eight, eight came from private condominiums located in the White Building. On page 13 of the 2003 County Management Plan, it states single family residential property that is used exclusively as a residence will not be assessed. Of those eight uh, signers, petitioners, ten were delinquent on payment of the case. Even in this case, I'm, 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 I don't believe what that, that was clear. Oh, well, I'm not clear. Now, when you say motion to deny, there has to be something to deny. There has to be a request. Okay. The first, first thing is, and this is what I try to bring out, and I think the legal spoke to this, there is nothing to even talk about approving or denying because nothing exists. All right. You okay. are. That's first and foremost. So what are you denying? You denying something that don't even exist already? Absolutely. I mean, we got we got to be clear. We got to do this thing right. I'm not. I agree, which is why I'm focusing on the rules of the procedure that we are governed by, following the call for the question. So, but we got to get that clear. clear. I, I just, I'm not clear of what we're denying. I'm not clear most of the time of what we're doing these days. I mean, that's why I have let's, legal. let's just do this. Let's go to legal counsel. And I, I agree, you've made good points. So how can you deny something that's not in place to begin with? Mr. McKenzie, what would be, or is there even. I mean, I think if the motion would be a substitute motion to receive as information, we have a substitute motion to receive as information that's been properly taken. 
I will tell you, gentlemen, the chair rules that we, we've debated this enough, the question has been called for, and the question has been called for, so it's been that, Wasn't that on the original motion that was made? What's that? Um, whatever the submission is actually most of it. Golly. Okay, can we do a class in parliamentary procedure? <laughs> would be, Mr. McKenzie, would it be appropriate to have discussion on the substitute motion? The substitute motion is a motion incident to the main motion. If it's the belief of the chair that the issue has been discussed and no further information would be fruitful to discuss regarding the motion, then it would be appropriate to call the question. That would be the the ruling of the chair. So, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, yes. you're talking about a class now. When you call for the question, that's a vote to see if there's any more discussion. You don't end it because you the question is called. Okay. If there's um, some unreadiness, I mean, we mm -hmm. vote to see if there's enough votes to keep talking. Okay. Is the commission ready to vote on this issue? Okay. We have a substitute motion on the floor to receive this as information. Commissioners will now vote by the substitute sign of voting. That motion carries seven two with Mr. Fenoy and Mr. Jackson voting no, Mr. Lockett out. 